Welcome everyone to Pontos Fathom Press. This is our fourth podcast on Lovecraft. Uh, we were doing Lovecraft all this month, and um, our fourth podcast is going to take us into uh, an interesting space between uh, deep time Jungian themes, um, themes of Rudolf Steiner and uh, nihilism but also the fun hoaxy side of Necronomicons and um, and also what is that urge why do we all love Lovecraft so much and why do we why are there so many people trying to jump into the the faux Necronomicon space yeah uh, and it's you know I, I just finished reading the uh, uh, the uh, actually this is my second time I bought it so Daniel Harms and John Wisdom Gaunt's uh, let you guys know I bought your book twice now. So this is a great book. This is a, re, uh, a newer edition, um, different shape of the book. But this is a great book, the Necronomicon Files. Maybe we'll start with this book. So Necronomicon Files is a uh, basically a study of Lovecraft's fictional text. So as you guys know, and, and if you've seen the other podcasts in uh, Pontus Fathom Press podcast series, uh, we've been doing Lovecraft all month. And I was reading a bit from the Necronomicon uh, and, and kind of tracing the way the Necronomicon uh, as a fictional device, let's say, is, you know, it's it's the Boba Fett of the of the Lovecraft universe, you know, in, in the original. Uh, it's the it's the way that uh, we instantly know we're in Lovecraftian waters is when there's a reference to the Necronomicon, you know, and, and this kind of shorthand that, that authors can do when they have a mythos like this is, is fantastic. But more than that, there's sort of like this extended universe that's been built up around the Necronomicon. And the Necronomicon Files as a book really explores that, debunks several of the faux Necronomicons that are out there, uh, many of which uh, I've also owned. Oh, and speaking of that, uh, just a quick shout out to the channel. August Moldenhauer's uh, Genealogy of Cthulhu. It's a three volume set. Uh, you get the Genealogy of Cthulhu, Psychoanalysis of Rilia, Archaeology of Yogg Sothoth. You can check out the links down below. Uh, they are Yogg Sothothery at its best, looking into uh, Lovecraftian links to history, uh, the psychoanalysis of Necronomicon fragments, and the gibbering chaos of Lovecraftian writing. And finally, uh, the virulent cosmic strains of Yogg-Sothothery, like breadcrumbs to the witch house of Azathoth. So uh, please check these out if you want to support the channel. Also have a Patreon link below. But back to uh, Necronomicon Files. I, I think there's something interesting here. You know, uh, uh, the urge for people to create Necronomicons, right? is speaking to something else. And that's what I want to really focus today's podcast on. Like, what is that attraction to this idea of the dark uh, dark text, the dark uh, grimoire, so, you know, this sort of uh, dark uh, uh, kind of key to the whole Lovecraftian universe. So what, what the Necronomicon Files as a book does, I'm not going to kind of go into that angle, angle, but I kind of want to give a brief summary. They do a great job of looking at origins of things that are mentioned by Lovecraft. Like in our podcast, we've talked about um, Picatrix, we've talked about John Dee, uh, because they're all mentioned by Lovecraft, right? Or inferred, let's say inferred. Like John Dee is called out, but Picatrix might be inferred. And then they kind of take a step further. What were Lovecraft's inspirations for the for the Necronomicon? And even um, uh, Blavatsky's Isis Unveiled comes out, which is you know a a huge uh, cornerstone of science and theology from the theosoph theosophical works. Um, uh, so there's that kind of uh, components of Necronomicon files, but then Necronomicon files also goes into these hoax texts, where it's people are just jumping on the Lovecraft bandwagon, so to speak, and and or or are they? And this is where I want to come in and say, it's not just about finding is there a real love, uh, Necronomicon. I think it's much deeper than that, and this is what I kind of want to explore. And I think if we go back to just the attraction of it, you know, there's a great quote on the back here. 
by Steve Jackson, who himself is a fourth wall breaking game maker, uh, uh, and uh, with some occult overtones that are fun, right? So I think there's this occult and fun overtone in the magic that I think we don't we don't want to lose sight of, right? And uh, the J Steve Jackson quote says, "I've always enjoyed the Cthulhu mythos as a brilliant fiction. It is. I'm delighted to see this thorough debunking of those who would spoil the fun by insisting it's real." Now, this is really interesting because, listen, I am one who thinks Lovecraft is fun. One of my favorite horror authors. I have a channel, Paul Toss Fathom Hobbies, where I play Eldritch Horror, Cthulhu Wars, and Cthulhu Death May Die. I play Lovecraft-based games, desktop games. So believe me, I understand the fun side of it. Love the texts. Uh, publishing Lovecraftian books. I get the space. So I think to Steve Jackson's point, yes, it is fun. And, but for me, as a, as a kind of collector of the weird, what I think is very fascinating to me is that they even exist, these Necronomicon copies. And so many of them speaks to something that I kind of want to address in today's podcast. So what is, what is the profile, like, what, what is the, uh, what is this proliferation? of Necronomicons really about? And I, I've got it narrowed down to three areas that I kind of want to talk about today. Area one, well maybe it could be four. I mean the, the, the obvious one is it's cool fiction and it's fun as Steve Jackson attests to. And as the Necronomicon files as a book does a great job of listing out. They've got a whole section in the, in the final part about the Necronomicon in books and in entertainment, things like this. But they also do a great job of debunking Necronomicons and also looking at the occult roots of Necronomicons. So I think it's a great, uh, this book, I just finished reading it, so it's hot off the, rereading it. So it's hot on, hot on my mind. But I think the one area that I'd like to expand on that the Necronomicon files does a great job is, what is the intersection between people's interest in Cthulhu and Maybe the categories are nihilism, right? Or occult practices in general, right? Or deep history, ancient aliens. And then finally, Jungian shadow work. And then maybe as the, at the end, we'll talk about Rudolf Steiner and Ahriman. So it's going to get serious here. But it's not to say that Necronomicons are real, but what is our desire to have Necronomicons all about? I mean, really, a Necronom, and I think this comes from Necronomicon files. I think um, John Wisdom says, why would you want to have a book that summons the great old ones? I mean, it's kind of a fan fantastic, horrific idea, right? And that's what makes the fiction great fun. It's what makes the games great fun. We get to role play that out. But, but uh, I, I want to kind of take us back maybe uh, let's go from the the least spiritual to the philosophical uh, to the uh, theological and then finally off the rails into the deep occult mystery mystery schools kind of talk. So we'll start out with fiction. The Lovecraft work itself, it's a fantastic device uh, of a fiction to have the idea of a ancient text. I mean, like, you know, it's it's the letters of Jonathan Harker in Dracula. It's the King in Yellow from uh, Chambers books, right? It's, you know, the it's the play within the play of Hamlet. We love to have books within a mythos. You know, it's uh, how many books are mentioned in the Harry Potter series. I mean, and even in Lovecraft, there's others. There's Panotic manuscripts. There's the Borges's kind of uh, libraries and maps that are great devices in fiction. So I think right off, it's just great fun writing, and um, it's something that gets celebrated. It turns up in video games. It turns up in movies. You know, with the whole Evil Dead thing. You know, that, that is kind of an homage to the Necronomicon. But then l let's take a let's take a look a bit at the. I want to say the philosophical side of things. And I think this is a real key area. So, so one 
book that kind of comes up is um, Ligotti's Conspiracy of, Against the humus ra Human Race, right? So this is kind of the cosmic horror side of things. And then I'll also kind of pull in Nietzsche's Will to Power and then this Heideggerian research into that where he talks about European nihilism. Okay, so let's just kind of take it another step for what is this interest in the topics of maybe the sleeping Cthulhu, what is sleeping Cthulhu, right? What is the, what is the Necronomicon as a book? What, why would we seek this out? And listen, we seek it out in fantasy desktop games because it's fun to imagine, you know, a, a horrifying truth that is emerging. Right. And, and, and somewhere between um, nihilism, which comes out of Nietzsche, let's say, like Nietzsche saw a certain decline of history. And you could see even in Lovecraft's writings, um, he often talks about, you know, some of those kind of calls out to Lovecraft's racism, let's say, where he's talking about like degeneracy. And he sees like the, you know, Lovecraft was an odd character, not as not as social as he could have been, perhaps. And he seemed quite fear-based in his interactions with other people, right? So some of that nihilism comes through where we're no longer celebrating, you know, it's not the Renaissance anymore, right? It's not humanism is, is, is now on, on the tail end of the humanist movement. You know, we're on the tail end of Christianity. And, and you know, authors like Dostoevsky or Nietzsche, they started looking into this decline of civilization. They started looking at this... Um, where do we go from here? I mean, Freud classically talks about it in his uh, civilization and its discontents, right? So Freud talks about why is it that civilization, that which brought, brings us so much, um, so much goodness and so much security and so much safety and so much plenty, why is civilization that, caught, that, that cured uh, thousands of years of human struggle in our ability to share resources and improve our technology, improve our lifestyle. Why is it that same civilization is the cause of all human anxiety and at the root of so many neuroses, right? You have people like, and, and Lovecraft's a great example of it. You know, it's kind of a shut in. He's got his correspondences. He's living in a dream world, but he's creating great fiction from it and he's channeling something. And I think I want to kind of get into that channeling. And just like Dostoevsky channeled it, just like Nietzsche channeled it, and in, in a way, uh, in, in Heidegger's assessment of, of um, Nietzsche and his will to power, he, I think there's two areas that kind of sync up with Lovecraft in this, uh, let's call it the philosophical section of the lecture, of the podcast. So in Nietzsche's will to power, I think there's two big concepts in here. One is the nihilism concept, that, that values are, 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 as we separate ourselves from values, as we separate ourselves from uh, believing in a God, right? As you know, Nietzsche's God is dead, right? Is kind of a call out to uh, a turning one's back to the traditions of spiritualism and a grounding oneself in a kind of atheistic, and then that leads to a nihilistic kind of worldview. How does man conduct himself, right? And I think the, the, the modern counter of this is this conspiracy against the human race, which is like the the cosmic horror themes that we love about Lovecraft, like the hopelessness, we're just a rock in space with a pond scum of, of you know, fleshy mammalian minds, something like this, right? Uh, so, the, so, so there's the idea of nihilism coming from Nietzsche, but there's also the idea, and this is a weird one, of the eternal recurrence, right? So the re eternal recurrence, both of these topics discussed by Heidegger in his uh, four volume lectures, I, I've got the both editions of this here, but the idea of nihilism and the idea of eternal recurrence, meaning that history repeats itself kind of in a sh quick shorthand, right? Why, why do we see empires rising and falling? Why do we see these? And then that kind of leads us back to, you know, Lovecraft's correspondences to Robert E. Howard, you know, the, 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 the great old ones, civilization before civilization, uh, you know, alien origins, all of these kind of speculative histories that kind of lay below the surface of Lovecraft, right? So you kind of have this play in the philosophy space 
and in the sort of like social space of you know society is decaying nihilism is rising belief in gods is at its all-time low and just then you've got these two concepts is it nihilism is it just a an expression of you know human anxiety and human fears you know the nightmares of lovecraft or is it something deeper it, are we turning a page toward the theological toward the occult interests right so I think um, I think it, at this point you know maybe we can go into the next section of the topic um, you know one of the critiques that you have by spiritualists, let's say, of, of something like Nietzsche or Heidegger is that, is that they very are much a material, um, maybe atheistic worldview. And listen, even Cosmic Core itself uh, is kind of that atheistic. So if we only believe in the fleshy mammal mind, there's a horror to that in itself. And I think that's, that's really explored in Ligotti. It's really also explored in the, uh, the great uh, books from... Uh, zero books like uh, Eugene Thacker's In the Dust of This Planet, like the horror of philosophy, like this is a great book. So, you know, these books kind of explore that, that nihilistic uh, horror that's within the Western philosophical tradition where we're, we're sort of moving away from spiritualism and toward neuroscience and things like this, right? But now, and this will eventually, and I'll, and I'll kind of lead this into Steiner later, Right, so so the sort of the mind body, re re uh, dualism re emerging together, uh, in in what a lot of the work that Blavatsky was doing. So maybe let's go into occult next. Let's go into occult, and then we'll end up with psychology, and then we'll end up with Steiner. So in lots of ways, everybody's seeking, you know, necrom necromancy. Right, you've got a necronomicon. It's a fantastic idea, and you've got this access to these powerful beings. Right. And, you know, I've got this great book from Haiti and Press, uh, Necrom Necromancy. I mean, this is the most beautiful book I own. It's a Necromancy in the uh, Medici Library. And these are necromantic spells uh, for uh, s getting demons and devils on your side for things like love and influence that I'm working my way through this. So it's really uh, curses, uncurses, wraths. It's all kinds of great magics. So the idea of these necromantic books was always something that, you know, the, a certain kind of um, faction of occultist was attracted to. You know, we have Picatrix, as we mentioned before. There is a historical tradition for exploring dark books in an occult way. And finally, we have like Love, finally, we have like Crowley. Right, so Crowley, and there's lots of work between showing comparisons to Crowley and some of the Lovecraftian concepts, you know. But again, what what is this? What is this impulse? What is the impulse to try to break the veil between um, magic and science, or religion and science? There's sort of this breaking, this portals opening, right? So I, I kind of want to go into the influences of Lovecraft, maybe. And as we know, there's there's lots of evidence. Necronomicon Files points it out. Uh, biographers of Lovecraft point it out. There's lots of evidence that he kind of poo-pooed theology. He kind of looked down on astrology. He wasn't particularly spiritual. And at the same time, uh, as I've talked about in lots of my podcasts, I'm quite interested in the um, overlap between um, imagination and spiritualism, I guess is the thing, where it's sort of like there's a, uh, what are we contacting with, right? So I think Isis Unveiled talks a lot about the, the blending of science and theology, right? And I think that there's even parallels between Jung and say Crowley, right? Because if you read Crowley and you read Jung side by side, writings, you know, somewhat in similar time frames or saying like reacting to the changing world at, in a similar time you can also see that there's a bit of an occultist in Jung and there's a bit of a psychologist in Crowley you know I, I mean Crowley is definitely in a lot of ways speaking to the the modern 
do what thou wilt and that shall be the law is very, uh, you know, very self-affirming. Um, it's very independent thinking. It's very egocentric. And, but it's also very much the way uh, people have been disenfranchised from um, you know, organized religions in a lot of ways, uh, in the West at least. And, um, and I think Jung also kind of calls this out in, in, in his Aeon, right? And in, in Jung's Aeon, he also talks about the idea that the age of Christianity, you know, the Christ age, was sort of a necessity of the long procession of history. And that was sort of a lesson that the world had to go through. Like we went from the age of uh, the, the prior age, the Roman Empire time, the Greek and Roman Empire times. And then we moved into this Christian era, which was where we looked inward in the Christian era, right? So people were looking inward and, uh, and Steiner goes off a lot about, about this. But you start to see there's some talk here with the Aeon that takes us back to Nietzsche's eternal, return, uh, uh, eternal recurrence, right? The idea of large swaths of time are progressing and the spirit of the age is changing and yet some things are repeating. And I think even Crowley, Crowley's tarot is based on the aeon, right? He has the aeon in his, in his tarot, which is linked to his uh, symbolism from Kabbalah and things like this. In his, uh, so I think there's a certain kind of magic at work in just contemplating these ideas. And where do we find Lovecraft's fiction? Well, obviously inspired by all of the above. I mean, inspired by Blavatsky, inspired somewhat by occultism. Lovecraft comes out with this idea of not only sleeping gods under the ocean, not only ancient old ones before history, but of a, a mad god at the center of the cosmos, you know, things that are too frightful to know about rising cities, which kind of seem like an analog to Atlantis, you know, about uh, the sort of a twisted version of religion, you know, sort of a twisted view of it. And, and in a lot of ways, channeling in a fictional way, channeling a lot of Crowley's work and channeling a lot of Jung's work and channeling a lot of Blavatsky's work. Can we call it influences? Sure, it could be just fiction with influences. But I want to go back to that idea, not of Necronomicons as being just hoaxes, and not to take all the fun out of Lovecraft as a fiction, but to talk about now our obsession with Lovecraft and the Necronomicon. And, and when I say our, I mean there's so many copies of Necronomicons out there. There's lots of fans for, there's dozens of games out there about Lovecraft. And it goes back to, uh, and this will kind of bridge us into the final section uh, of the podcast. So, hey, thanks for join in so far. If you have some comments, would love to hear from you. Uh, we'll probably advance this to a live stream at some point. I'm just trying to build up some followers. So it's really important just starting out my channel if you can like and subscribe. Uh, also a Patreon down below. I am planning to uh, keep going with this, exploring uh, some texts deeply and uh, your support would be really appreciated. Lo love to hear from you guys what you think and um, uh, I will... Uh, respond back if you guys have questions or any comments for some future content. I think next month I'm going to focus on uh, Frank Herbert's Dune. I'm going to do a bunch of podcasts on Dune, but with a similar bent, uh, Dune and, uh, and some alchemical work and also Dune and the work of um, Samuel Butler with the Benny Gesserit. So that, that's some stuff that's coming up. So thanks for your support and looking forward to your comments. Okay, so let's go into the end of the Christian era and the next Aeon. Well, this is where, you know, Jordan Peterson has called Aeon the most frightening book. And in a way, it is quite, it's quite a statement uh, that Jung makes. I've read Aeon a few times now, and it's always amazing how much is in there. But the idea is Christianity was sort of flawed a bit in that it, it pushed, it gave us only Jesus, right? Jesus is the you know, maybe the ideal of the self, like the idea of, of a Jesus 
is a template for what a, a good person should be, a strong person, a spiritual person, right? But there was another side that, of, of the, you know, the great, uh, the great uh, Manichaean heresy, let's call it. That's with Jung uh, pointing out the Jesus-Satan kind of valence, valence, right? And I think this, this comes out a lot with the resurging interest in Gnosticism, right? So these days, you can't throw a stone without uh, another Gnostic Nancy coming out and telling us about, you know, the Gnostic world. And listen, I think it's great. I love you know, watching Aeon Bite, love watching uh, people talking about Gnosticism, enjoy lectures of Terence McKenna talking about Gnosticism. I think... Um, you know, in university, I got to study under, uh, uh, learned a lot about Mithraism and Gnosticism from, uh, from university, had some great professors there. And, uh, and I think that the Gnostic tradition, where, where there's a different sort of, you know, worldview, and I think to put it in Christian terms, you know, it's in like the B book of John, which is about the Logos coming down, and also that the, the, go the God of the Old Testament is is a mad demiurge, right? And you start looking at a mad god who has a horrific, distorted idea of what the world can be. Doesn't bode well for us, right? And this kind of is the opposite of the nihilism position, right? The nihilism position is like, and it's the, and it's the, the Gnostics are kind of like the existential position, right? So again, we have that that, 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 that sort of voyage from nihilism and then modern, like, you know, ancient Gnosticism and then modern Gnosticism as existentialism. And, you know, in a way that the existential dread of cosmic horror is right in that space. And yet, and yet, Jung says there's a reckoning coming in the next aeon in which we'll have to balance out that energy, right? We'll have to look at rising forces and again you start saying rising forces you start seeing old ones and i want to kind of compare this in with jung's topic of the shadow work right and this is going to lead us to uh rudolf steiner so shadow work for jung is the concept of you know we have the unconscious right and within the unconscious jung discovered uh, a wealth of a wealth of um Uh, a structure, let's call, of the, the bigger self. So the self com is comprised of both our conscious uh, ego and our conscious persona, the way we present ourselves to the world and the way we think of ourselves, but also a deep unconscious. And that deep unconscious actually is our connectedness to the human story, right? So we've come from our parents, we come from our grandparents, we're born in our countries, uh, our countries went through turmoils that set the stage for different generations who reacted to it all the way back through history, this long trail back through history. And Jung discovered with, al with his alchemy and collective unconscious work that you could actually tap into one's own unconscious and discover through uh, structures within the unconscious that Jung discovered. Things like the animus and the anima, which are like relating functions, or echoes of our parents' influence on us. So we have mothers and fathers, and you know that gives us a, an idea of what a man is, what a woman is. We internalize these things. They, they merge with the myth-making collective unconscious mechanism. And then, uh, then we, our struggle begins to find who we are and our place in, our, in the world and knowing ourself. You know, let's just put it this way. And um, uh, if somebody could summarize it better, we could talk about this ion forever. So the idea here is uh, if we take that unconscious journey, you know, even Freud calls looking at dreams as like the river Archeron, right? So the well, Acheron, you know, the river of the underworld. And it's sort of like there's always this kind of submerged underworld with unconscious work. And the other structure Jung talked about was the shadow, which is sort of like the part of you that you don't want to see, but all your friends could kind of see, like when you act. You know, you might be prideful, but you think of yourself as humble. 
but you get this haughty thing that your friends notice, but you always kind of look away from it. You don't want to see yourself as weak. You don't want to see your bad things. And we live in a time where we're self-affirmating, right? We, we live in a time of, uh, to, uh, to sort of uh, embrace oneself, but we also live in a time where people are introspective. And this has come on since, you know, really since Christian times, which may be in some ways an early psychology, right? And so this work of let's look at where our weaknesses are and do that shadow work. Jung also expanded this idea of the shadow work into the work of the generation. And he has a great essay, a frightening essay on Odin that he wrote uh, as in the rise of World War II, talking about how this Odinic um, metaphor of the uh, collective unconscious was like Odin as the as the visitor from the woods who comes and messes things up and stirs uh, stirs the hearts of people in ways that they didn't expect, you know. And, and we can find that as we go through, for example, you know, this, there's this saying that you don't know what someone's made of until you see them under pressure or under stress. And certain things emerge out of their personality, right? And we can even see in these current times with the coof and stuff like that, how there's lots of fear and paranoia, like are, are, are you know people transmitters, of of uh, are they vectors, you know? And I think that the, a bit of that paranoia has come throughout the ages. I mean, we've had communist scares, we've had inquisitions, we've had uh, you know Qatar crusades, we've had lots of, you know, we've had heresies in the church, we'd have Christians burned. There's been lots of these fear-based. Um, uh, reactions to a collective shadow and then something suddenly about Lovecraft's Necronomicon work Lovecraft's old ones work seems to be paralleling the researches that Jung was doing with the Aeon and even the researches that Crowley was doing when Crowley talks about the demonic summoning it, it to me it's almost a parallel but with a different focus on looking within and raising it up, right? So you raise, for Jung, it's about raising the shadow in the unconscious to the consciousness, to know your own uh, weak spot, let's say, to know your own flaw and to sort of bring it forward. And you can do it just within yourself. You know, you can, you know, uh, without going out of your door, you can know all things on earth, right? And so. But the world shadow is something much bigger. The world shadow is like, you know, how did, you know, how did World War II happen, right? How did a crusade against the Qatar happen? How did, how did these uh, horrific, horrific wars and things like this? How do we find ourselves again back to Nietzsche? How do we find ourselves in these this eternal recurrence of the same? Right? Why is it that man keeps struggling with these things? And suddenly here, I kind of feel a bit of where our inspiration and fa fascination of the Necronomicon and with Lovecraft lay, because I feel that this is the space. And I, I think the, I think the uh, Necronomicon files touches on this, but I kind of am taking it, uh, as you can see, in a further direction, that the urge to uh, know the great old ones through the black grimoire of Necronomicon is really, la is really lacking the tools to wrestle with lost history, um, the lies of history, the shadow of our past, which sounds a little bit like original sin, uh, and our relation to other entities, you know, and there's a lot of these relations that we don't have the spiritual science to deal with. I mean, I think that a lot of the Christian age, uh, science took a, a step away from religion, but you still have mysticism and mystery schools that kind of talked about this stuff. And I think this is a great transition into this work by Rudolf Steiner. So this book is called The Archangel Michael, His Mission and Ours. And it's a fascinating book. It also has a deep history and aeon theme. Uh, this edition has the Johannes Trimithius um, appendix, 
where he talks about the different angels ruling different swaths of history, different aeons of history, and how they're ruled by each of these angels, and that's what characterized the events of that age. So it's kind of like this taking the history, the wheel of history, and breaking it into these houses, almost astrologically. You know, and very much so the way Jung works with his aeon, you know, there was the pre-Christian era, there were eras before that, and there was the Christian era, now we're moving into this other era. And like Sleeping Cthulhu, Steiner talks about uh, Ariman. So um, Ariman is a, uh, originally, I believe it's a Persian uh, deity. But for uh, Steiner's work, Ariman is a kind of another devil compared to Satan. So you have Lucifer, who is more of the genius, adversarial, the light bringer, um, super ego, you know, he's very, um, he's a, he's princely almost, and he's, um, he's the diabolical devil, right? And I think that uh, Steiner would call out that even the age of science is partly Luciferian, in that it's a, it's marked by genius, it's marked about the world, it's this world, right? And it's moving into this world. And on the other side of that coin, you have uh, Ariman which is a different kind of, it's more of a demonic um, force. So with Lucifer, you have more the case of you want to uh, be the genius, you want to shine, you want to be vain, right? There's vanity there, there's also pride there. There's so many of those sins that are in the Lucifer strain. But if you go into the Ariman strain, it's more like, no, 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 we want you to be reduced to a cog. We want you to be reduced to just part of a bigger demonic machine. No, no identity, no individualism, no um, a, a, a diminished access to spirit and mind, dumbed down almost, right? So, so Steiner really refines in his works. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to I'm, I'm picking up the book um, uh, Lucifer and Ariman by Steiner. Maybe I'll do a Steiner month after. Um, after I've got the, um, after my next month with Dune books. I also want to do a Philip K. Dick month, so maybe I'll have a poll in the Patreon if you guys want to pick which month you want to come first. Uh, we can do the Steiner month. Uh, we can do uh, Philip K. Dick. I've got a, a, a lot of great research into Philip K. Dick that, you, that I'd like to share with you. But anyway, so going back to the, um, the question of these various devils, like why is Steiner interested in it? Well, mainly, Steiner is... Uh, fascinated by the idea of uh, our place in relation to evil and enter the Archangel Michael. So what we have in this work is, so let's think of the idea of redeeming evil, right? And this will get us back to Lovecraft eventually, so just bear with me here. But it also is about Jung's Aeon. It's a similar point to Jung's Aeon. So with Jung's Aeon, he has the idea of the Christ event happens. We go, go, to the, go through the 2,000 years of the age of Pisces, the fish age, the Christian era. Now we're entering the aeon of Aquarius. So it's the starlight pouring down onto, uh, onto the earth. It's the flow of Aquarian energy down, something like this. And it's also um, potentially a revaluing of how will we reconcile the Christ instinct and the satanic instinct? How do we resolve that? And that that tension will be the next challenge, perhaps, of the next 2,000 years. Well, this is exactly what Rudolf Steiner says. Rudolf Steiner echoes this 100%, that um, it will be, in the coming ages, the duty of people to stand while these Arimonic forces rise. And one can't help but hear the echoes of Lovecraft, uh, this kind of reluctant, um, sensitive type who, hey, in giving us great fiction, we often get great philosophy and we get some great lessons on the failings of spirituality, the failings of civilization. And I think Lovecraft is no different. I mean. Obviously, Dostoevsky jumps to mind about 
someone who uh, really can take moral dilemmas and psychologize them and take us inside to the um, the horrific torment that can go on in a person's conscience. I mean, this is Dostoevsky taking real world, um, real world environmental um, interactions, and then the internalized journey of the of the uh, protagonist. Lovecraft does a total different thing, though. Lovecraft just gives us enough of a hint of the darkness of the madness of the thing out of our sanity which is something that uh, resonated with me in Rudolf Steiner and, and, and here's where it is so Steiner has a has a section we talks about our our responsibility toward evil so evil exists in the world and um, and as a as a human being we could do something to stop uh, something that's harmful to mankind let's say so say for example let's take a small let's take it from a small example like um, somebody steals something from the local store and you catch him right and then you say tell him why stealing's bad and and you reconcile that crime something like this or you do something where there's a suffering and you remove the suffering right so there's a you know, hunger and you feed right something like this or there's no education and you educate so there's these little effects of evils that are you know and I think this is the 20th century is mostly about framing all evil in the socio-economic political ways right but there is in Steiner's view there's a root that's more evil there's a there is the evil and it kind of goes back to one of the things that turns people off from religion is how could God let evil exist and that's where that's one of those points that Jung talks about is that there is this Manichaean heresy that's still alive and the American Manichaean heresy is that that good and evil are both forces that play out in the human soul and and uh, Steiner gets really deep on this the Steiner takes this very deeply so the idea is yeah you can work to prevent evil uh, but at some point the evil will be too big for you to work with it right so this is where I mean this is the this is a great theme of Lovecraft and it's a great theme of a lot of modern horror movies you know the idea of there's something on the other side it's really evil it possesses the person they're lost in the dark world you know there's a lot of movies with this kind of theme and Lovecraft has this always this device of the horror of the characters figuring out that the world that they knew is not what it seemed and it's and it's a thin veneer away from horrors beyond imagination and I think with that spirit Lovecraft was tapped right into this Odinic force that Jung talks about uh, uh, the the shadow work of the the age even with Crowley's sort of idea of what the occult's role in the black schools of magic sort of fit with this where it's like given the fact that these forces are out there Crowley's kind of like hey given the force that these uh, the fact that these forces are out there how do we position ourselves as you know even semi-atheistic beings like how do we think about we don't really know what the entities and the forces are let's know them and this is his occult a bit of his occult response and it comes off as a black school but in a way it's very parallel to Jung's work as you know this integration work you know shadow integration but th the weird point that we get to that's kind of like the unknowable nature of the madness of Azathoth or the or the unknowable knowledge of Yogg-Soth or, or, or what waits for us when Sleeping Cthulhu awakens or the uh, history bending um, portrayal of Nyarlathotep right what what Steiner says with the angel Mark Michael Archangel Michael's not, uh, Michael's often depicted with his foot upon or his sword over over the devil and Michael is seen as the um, you know if you look at prayer cards or whatever Michael is 
always a vanquisher of evil. You know, police uh, have prayers to uh, in the day, had prayers to Saint Michael to protect them. You know, so so in a way, he was the uh, archangel assigned to Lucifer. And Steiner kind of doubles down on this, and he talks about how, well, if the idea of uh, if the idea is redemption of evil, right? The redemption of evil. Uh, you get to a point where the evil is big enough, right? The evil is big enough that it will drive a person mad or corrupt a person, right? So this kind of this sounds a lot like the warnings in the beginning of the Necronomicon or the warnings from Lovecraft's um, uh, investigators into the great old ones who come up against madness. And it's always also a mechanic of so many of these so many of these Lovecraftian games. And listen, back to the Steve Jackson idea, just because we love to have fun with it and play it doesn't mean it doesn't echo in the truth. I mean, some of Steve Jackson's games seem prophetic even, right? With his, and I call it fourth wall sort of breaking, but, uh, you know, he had, I believe he had images of World Trade Towers something weird like that in one of one of his uh, Illuminati games. But anyway, so um, so the idea here is that uh, so with the evil so big, that evil that kind of a Lovecraft sort of talked about, the evils that uh, we see purported to be summoning in the Necronomicon, with an evil that big, only the Archangel Michael is strong enough to redeem that angel. So Michael's mission, it says his mission, Michael's mission is to be the redeemer of Satan. So here again, we have a shadow work, right? What does to redeem the evil mean? Well, in a Jungian sense, we kind of go back to Jung, uh, he kind of feels that within each of us, there is the propensity of good and the propensity of evil, and that those forces sort of have to be, that the, those things have to be brought to consciousness, right? So the idea of bringing it to consciousness means be aware of why it's happening, be aware of what you're doing, right? And it's a double-edged sword. And you can see that if, if, if Crowley has a slightly different idea of this, if he's the black school, then you might see Steiner as the white school, which is the idea of um, Crowley's kind of idea is like, get yours because they'll take it from you. And kind of Crowley's thing is, uh, learn to harness the force, which is kind of like what Jung is saying too. learn to integrate the shadow. But what Steiner says is, oh, it's, it's the Manichaean heresy was was made a heresy to kind of keep it from us for a while. It's like it's sleeping Cthulhu, right? It's the idea of there is a big evil and the big evil will rise and the fleshy minds of mortals won't be able to contend with it. But hey, good news is there's again, Gnostically, right? We start looking at the 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 um, the rising to the logos. There are forces above the demiurge, and Michael Archangel comes out as this force, which is there to take the role of redeeming Satan. And only something at an archangel level could redeem something as powerful as Satan. And so, yeah, I haven't I haven't read uh, Steiner's. Lucifer and Ariman uh, series, but I think that's I think that's a, a good place to stop. Uh, what do you guys think? I mean, where do you think, uh, where do you feel Lovecraft lies on that spectrum of, is he just a lost soul, or did he really tap into some of these deep seated cultural shadows, co collective unconscious? Did he really tap into it in a way that sort of shows, you know, it's not just nihilism. There is a reason for the nihilism, and the reason for the nihilism is, you know, we're at the end of a, an era, and we're dawning into a new era, and this is a long uh, Gnostic uh, eternal recurrence. And in doing so, in evoking the idea of a Necronomicon, he's almost finding... Like in a way, the Necronomicon could be something of the books I've showed you today. Like the idea is we're looking into the dark space. We're talking about ways to control it, ways to understand it, ways to know it. Uh, we're looking at the limits of it. You know, my, with, with Steiner, the limits of it is like, well, you're not an archangel. So 
Good luck to you, right? And Necronomicon Files talks about this too. It's like, why would anyone want to raise something that's the madness of the universe, right? And it goes into the Jung shadow work, and it goes into Crowley's occult research, and it goes into our general fascination from all the ages in uh, necromantic texts, you know, like even, um, yeah, well, that, uh, maybe I'll leave it at that. So, um, so yeah, uh, what do you guys think? Uh, podcast number four, winding down here. Love to hear from everyone. Uh, leave a comment. Uh, really help me out to like and subscribe. If you're interested in this kind of stuff, uh, you can check out the Genealogy of Cthulhu, the Psychoanalysis of Rilia, sort of uh, skirting the, the line between uh, science and horror. Uh, really appreciate it. And check out the Patreon below. Okay, guys, going to wrap it up here. Uh, look forward to uh, some more podcasts next month, uh, doing some book reviews as well. Uh, appreciate your support and you can check out Pontos Fathom Hobbies as I mentioned if you're into Cthulhu and Lovecraft playing all the, the games over there so thanks a lot for watching and if you made it this far you're the best bye bye